right? People are joining. Well, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, and welcome to our highly anticipated webinar from Evidence to Action for Children, the role of evidence, research, and knowledge to strengthen social protection systems in Asia and the Pacific. We are delighted to have you with us today as we explore ways of enhancing evidence and knowledge around child-sensitive social protection in Asia and the Pacific. My name is Ruben Villanueva. I am the Social Protection Specialist at the UNICEF Regional Office for East Asia and the Pacific, and I will be your moderator today. During the webinar, we will come with the participation of uh, esteemed experts, practitioners, and thought leaders who have dedicated their uh, careers to advancing social protection throughout this region. Before we start, though, we encourage you to share your questions during the webinar using the Q&A box uh, option available in Zoom. When you do so, uh, please state uh, your name and organization, uh, if uh, so, and whether your question is directed to a specific speaker. Feel free to raise your questions at any time during the session. Also, uh, you are invited to interact with us uh, through Twitter using uh, hashtag SPORG webinar. And now, without further ado, we commence our program with great pleasure as we welcome uh, Miozin Nyund, UNICEF Regional Deputy Director for East Asian Pacific, for the opening remarks. Mio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ruben. Good afternoon to everyone and warm greetings from Bangkok to the audience online and to our distinguished panelists. Thank you very much for being here with us for this important event. We're very happy to officially launch our new book, The Social Protection in East Asia and Pacific, From Evidence to Action. The book documents the lessons from strengthening social protection system in the region. It will present you a curated selection of more than 70 research papers from 23 countries in six regions, which were produced during the last five years. The book also explores the connection between the research and policy development. It is written by individuals who have been actively involved in social protection countries, including UNICEF staff, researchers, academic institutes, and also government officials. On behalf of the UNICEF Regional Office in East Asia and the Pacific, I would like to thank you all, the authors, for the book and for your valuable contribution, ideas, and experiences. The evidence that you generated not only contribute to the recognition of the right of the every child to benefit from social protection, it also shaped the policies and programs which are indispensable to the full realized emphasis today goes beyond the knowledge in the article themselves. Instead, we are particularly interested in moving from the evidence from the knowledge to action. So the question is, so what? We have distinguished experts who will engage in thought-provoking discussions on the crucial role of evidence, research, and knowledge, how we can strengthen social evidence and knowledge. In order to effectively expand social protection in East Asia and the Pacific, we need renewed support and transformative innovations more than ever. Strong and reliable evidence is essential to government system building, program design and implementation, and coordination across multiple sectors and stakeholders. In East Asia and the Pacific region, we have less evidence generated on social protection compared to other regions, such as Latin America, Africa. I hope this initiative will provide us a momentum to reflect on how we can together as governments, academic institutions, units to improve this and establish this region as a true leader in innovative and effective policy-oriented research and knowledge generation. 
the more we incorporate evidence, research, and knowledge in our strategies in strengthening the social protection system in the region, our interventions will definitely be more effective and efficient in the long term. By doing so, we will not only safeguard the rights of the child, but also ensure sustained economic growth and prosperity in our countries in the region. I really look forward to lively discussion and recommendations from this event and I thank you for your attention. Back to you Ruben. Thank you so much Mio uh, for these inspirational opening remarks and uh, a good reminder of uh, what we need to do uh, in the future to strengthen the evidence. So now we will uh, continue with a thought-provoking presentation about precisely that, the book uh, that we are launching today and the role of the evidence and research uh, to strengthen that social protection systems in Asia and Pacific. This presentation uh, will be delivered by Andrea Rossi, his UNICEF Regional Advisor for Social Policy and Economic Analysis uh, for East Asia and Pacific. Andrea will introduce us to the valuable lessons learned in the last years and insights uh, on the research and policy making for social protection. Andrea, back to you, please. Thank you so much, uh, Ruben, and thanks so much, uh, uh, Mio, for, uh, for the introduction. And uh, thanks to all the, all the participants. Really, uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to have all of you uh, with us uh, uh, today. Um, what I would like to present is a little, uh, uh, give you a background of this book, but more, more importantly, starting a discussion together with different panelists and all of you about what would be the future of uh, research and, and evidence on social protection in this uh, in this region, in the Asian Pacific? Um, so, as Mio mentioned, the book we are launching today is really a summary of our long work that we have done in a few years. And uh, what you will have in the 12 articles that will be presented in this edited book is really a selection of uh, some of that experience. It's really uh, looking at the aspect stock taking of the policy impact and results for children and and really based on the on the ground story what we tried to do was to generate a um, collection of evidence that is for practitioner but produced by practitioner so all the authors that you will see in the book are the people that actually were involved in the policy process in each of the country so most of the time we have researcher unicef officer government that together wrote articles as a co-author, presenting the results of the research, but more importantly, looking at how the research was used. And that is the entire purpose of uh, uh, this publication. We will have uh, uh, articles from Cambodia, China, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, and also uh, contribution from colleagues from other regions that were useful for sparking the debate uh, here in East Asia and Pacific. So we, we have articles from India, from Sri Lanka, from Uganda, and also more importantly for our colleague from the UNICEF Innocenti Research Center. So as, uh, uh, as Mio mentioned before, this is a result of a large initiative that we started here at the regional office for East Asia and Pacific in, UNOS, in UNICEF to really to promote the generation of evidence and research to guide policy. Um, and the idea was to give quality, timeliness, consistency, and continuity of research in shaping the policy-making process in the region. The interesting is that this uh, initiative that originally was designed for East Asia and Pacific, at the end was expanded to other countries and other regions, really creating a possibility for cross fertilization and learning. And we learn a lot from the experience from other regions. In total, we have more than 71 research in 23 countries in almost all the region in the world, covering multiple aspects of social protection, as we just you can see in, in the slide. So we go from program design to system strengthening uh, to impact evaluation and et cetera. And more than 90% of that, the, that work of the knowledge work was focused on country, on the field. We had a little on regional level and at global level. For a total investment, though more than $5 million. But what probably is interesting is that this initiative actually started as a, an administrative shortcut, is what the news have called a long term uh, agreement. I mean, it mainly means uh, a way to identify providers for research that can be hired quickly. So, in a form, a cutting, uh, a, a way to uh, have a shortcut on paperwork. But then we thought that all those research, all those uh, um, 
initiative were in a way creating a way to become a kind of knowledge lab because we were sharing consultants, the same consultant companies that were working for multiple countries. So sharing the experience they have built before, sharing the training of those consultants, sharing the questions in many uh, research, uh, sharing the experiences, the results, and also sharing the mistakes and comparing the merit. So this is what this is initiative has been for, the, for all these years and what this book in a way celebrates and consolidates. It's in a way part of a long process um, in UNICEF that we work on evidence and social protection, a process that was initiated by our colleague and generally speaking, all the, the researchers in Latin America many years ago, when we started looking at the importance of the evidence to look at social protection policies. And definitely they were the pioneers on that. Then it was followed by the incredible investment by UNICEF, by the UN, by academics, in create, generating not just evidence, but generating strong evidence on social protection. And that was consolidated in the first book that was published now almost 10 years ago uh, by UNICEF and FAO with the same title, From Evidence to Action, that we wanted to, to link with. But at the time, the key elements was you know, bringing the ideas of randomized control trying to, to or our solid uh, research to look at MythBuster to show how the evidence can be generated to a very uh, strong way. This publication, this work, in a way, want to follow the steps uh, to move not only to have strong evidence, but actually to focus on the next step. And the next step is the use and impact of, uh, uh, of the evidence on social protection policies. Um, as Mio mentioned, the level of research existing in the Asian Pacific is still limited compared with the rest of the region and something that we need to address because here we do have the competences, we do have the resources, and as UNICEF and UN, we want to facilitate the process that actually can be generated locally. So this idea to focus on the impact of our research is goes in a way try to challenge uh, the fantasy model that has it was uh, mentioned at one, at one time when we create uh, evidence. This idea that because we create a research and then we assume the policymaker reads uh, the study, that will change everything and poverty ends. Well, that's definitely a very superficial level of understanding the linkages between evidence and policy. Policy, uh, uh, the use of evidence for policy making requires huge investment and huge attention. And also makes requires different understanding of the different players, understanding that um, in order to use the, the, the evidence for policy maker, you don't just need to be the in-depth expert as for, for example, an academic, but we need to have that policy skills and capacity and knowledge that make possible the transfer of the knowledge generated in research into a policy decision. For that one, we have need to understand that policy, policy makers live in a different environment, they speak a different language, and most of the time have different priorities. What we learned with this process is definitely that the idea uh, that the research process can be part of on the solution, when we engage policymakers within the research process, so we treat them as a partners and not as a policymakers and not just a policy readers, then the things change dramatically. And today we will have with us policymakers that were co-author of the, of the papers and that work with us on these areas. And the question that we always say, as we try to ask ourselves is to always remember that we have to compare the time and the money that we invest in the research and then ask ourselves how much we are investing, how much time we are dedicating to the policy process, to using our research for the policy decision. That some time is very minimum uh, compared with the time to generate research. And by to, to conclude, I think the all our work, all the our efforts to work on the evidence generation to research is really driven and guided by the key principle of children's rights. And this idea that we want to look at the best interest as a, our primary consideration. But the only way to assess the best interest of the children is not just based on moral judgment or principles or value. We need to have the evidence that shows that actually the decision we taken, despite our assumption and objective, was the one that really generated the best uh, uh, results for children. So, to have this one, what we will have now is uh, really to start a discussion with a fantastic group of uh, panelists. And we look at on the role of the evidence in social protection system in the Asian Pacific, looking at more four 
generic areas of, uh, of questions. So one is what is the current emerging research priorities and also new ways to do research. What is the next step of uh, research and evidence on social protection? Um, how the research is used by national level and policymaker to shape their policy? What is the, the need and the demand and the experience of policymaker? How we can enhance the influence of academic research, understanding that particularly in East Asia and Pacific, the generation of evidence is not just of UNICEF. We just produced, I think we estimated less than 8% of all the evidence existing on, uh, on children's and, and children's rights. The still is a big one, but again, it means that 90% is generated by academic institutions, amazing researchers with a fantastic experience they have in, we have in the region. And finally, how we can work together as, a, as, as UN, as development partners, as donors to facilitate evidence-based decision making. What is the new role that we can play in this region, in this moment, for the future of social protection? With this one, I would like to start uh, uh, to have uh, a discussion and presenting the fantastic uh, uh, panelists that will be with us, uh, that we have from Innocenti, from uh, we have Nyasha uh, from the UNICEF University Research Center. We have Ms. Rodora from the Director of Policy Development and the Planning Bureau from the Philippines. We have Professor Sam Chai, that is the Research Director from Thailand. Um, and then next, next slide. We have uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Rams, uh, Rex May uh, from Cambodia. And uh, uh, we'll have uh, Felicity from different Australia as a fantastic panel. So with these uh, uh, panelists, we would like to start the first question. And uh, uh, the first question is actually from uh, for uh, Nyasha, our colleague from the UNICEF, UNICEF Research Center in, uh, uh, in Florence. And uh, Nyasha, welcome first. Thank you so much for being with us. And we would like to ask you, what are the emerging research priorities and future research requirements that can help address the gaps and challenges in strengthening social protection system for children in Asia and Pacific? Over to you, Nyasha. Uh, thank you, Andre. Um, good afternoon and good morning to all the participants. And um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to address uh, this question. I think that this is an important and timely question given the current opportunities and for and challenges to strengthen social protection systems in the Asian Pacific region. So looking at uh, the current statistics for social protection coverage at present, only 44% of the population is covered by at least one social protection benefit. And in addition to that, just 18% of the children are covered by social protection when compared uh, to the coverage amongst older persons. So there is a lot of ground to cover in the race to achieve uh, SDG 1.3, you know, which, which talks about universal social protection coverage by 2030. And um, a critical aspect of the efforts to achieve SDG 1.3 will be the building of comprehensive domestically financed and child sensitive social protection systems. And this would require many parts to come together and work harmoniously. So whether that includes the legal framework or policies, the design and implementation of various programs, uh, monitoring and evaluation, and more crucially sustainable uh, financing. So now um, to answer the question, in order to address the gaps and challenges in strengthening social protection systems for children in the Asian Pacific region, there are six key research priorities that I will talk about. So first, and to ensure that no child is left behind, there is need for comprehensive uh, research on the feasibility and impacts of un universal child benefits in various countries in the region, especially research that looks at how universal child benefits can be progressively realized, uh, starting with the most vulnerable children. And uh, linked to this research would also be a, a comprehensive analysis of inclusion and exclusion errors in where programs are being targeted. And um, in addition to that, and as demonstrated by chapter four in the book, um, there are many research approaches that could actually be used to do these assessments. So this could include ex-ante analysis that focus the impacts of universal child benefits 
And other research could also focus on the design and implementation features, the impacts of universal child benefits on child poverty, the return to investment, and also their cost effectiveness. And then the second research priority that I would talk about um, is more about the generation of evidence that informs um, the design and implementation of adaptive and shock responsive social protection, especially climate related shocks. So several countries in the region, for example, Philippines and Myanmar, they have a high climate risk index and some like Vietnam are also disaster prone. So we know that children are disproportionately affected by shocks. So whether it's uh, in terms of representation or the effects of the shocks, children are usually the most affected. So for instance, you know, talking about the book, I will refer to chapter 12, um, which uh, looks at the, the impacts of the recent COVID-19 uh, pandemic and its economic impact uh, in the Philippines and how it led to an increase in child poverty for the first time. Uh, in, in 20 years. So in this era of poly crisis, so we have not just climate shocks, but we also have a cost of living crisis and we, we have conflicts. There is need for more research to, re, to inform the design of sustainable shock responsive social protection systems that are also child sensitive. So research could look at um, integrating climate change adaptation with disaster risk reduction and management and with social protection. And the evidence should provide clarity on what really works in design and, and financing, especially uh, sustainable financing and also the governance of shock responsive social protection systems. So moving on uh, to the third research priority that I will talk about. Uh, it's, and for this one, I would like to emphasize the need for generating evidence on what works in, in establishing sustainable integrated social protection systems that are child sensitive. So we have uh, chapters seven and eight in the book that demonstrate that this is an issue of importance in several countries such as China and Cambodia, where there are many efforts currently underway to integrate social assistance for families and children at program and administrative levels. And in addition to that, it is also important to consider systemic integration, looking at the linkages between child sensitive social protection systems with services, social services that can help create synergies and maximize the effectiveness of social protection. So there is need to look at, you know, to, to generate evidence on especially the critical factors that facilitate or impede the integration of social protection systems. Examples of such factors would include governance structures, financing, legislation and policies, registries and information systems, which are usually part of the administrative architecture. The fourth research priority that we will talk about is the need for comprehensive for a comprehensive assessment of policy options to sustainably finance social protection for children. So sustainable financing is a crucial element for, for, for the building for, of any sustainable social protection system. And fiscal space remains a big constraint in, in, in many countries in the region, and countries must identify innovative ways of financing. So there may be some low hanging fruits, you know, whether it's looking at simple reallocations with, within uh, the national budgets or eliminating bottlenecks, but indeed there are choices to make, especially for countries that have high debt uh, burdens. And then for the fifth research priority, uh, it centers around the need for a greater understanding of the mainstreaming of age and gender in social protection. So we do know that individual needs across uh, the life course, they do vary, they do differ by age and gender, and social protection programs need to be designed with an age and gender lens to ensure that at least we do no harm and at best uh, use social protection as an entry point to drive transformative change in gender norms. On this, I do not see a lot of evidence coming from the region. And this is very essential given the entrenched gender inequalities uh, in the region, such as the higher value that is placed on boys as compared to girls or the women's expected participation in unpaid care and, and domestic work. 
and child marriage in some in some countries is is still a, a big problem and and also uh, another challenge is the violence uh, against women and girls and then um, last uh, but not least um, the other research priority that i've identified is the need for research on designing and implementing portable social protection by this is especially important for migrant populations so that they're able to access social protection or contribute when they move. So within this region, we, we do know that over 65 million international migrants live in the region and 107 million people live in another country other than their country of birth. And these mega trends in migration are not stopping anytime soon and limiting social protection to only citizens will continue to leave out many vulnerable children. So evidence that can be generated to try and identify the most optimal options for providing portable social protection to these migrant populations is, is crucial. So in conclusion, I would say that multi-country evidence is needed to address this res these research priorities, and it would be useful if that evidence is to some extent uh, consistent and comparable across countries, while also accounting for contextual factors. So within UNICEF, and as Andreas spoke about, we have made lots of investments into generating rigorous evidence. And at the Global Office of Research and Foresight, um, we are intensifying efforts to generate rigorous evidence from all different regions. And we stand ready to support this endeavor, especially with the aim of establishing comprehensive, domestically financed and child sensitive social protection systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nia, for a very, very important and very clear message. And uh, we are also very happy and proud to have uh, the Innocenti Research or uh, Center for Research and Oversight uh, working for us. It's, it's uh, uh, an amazing opportunity. And also, thanks so much for uh, also highlighting topics that may be in difficult now, but definitely will be priority in the future, the gender, the migration, the climate. This is the importance of research, not only to be reactive in what happened, what is the request, but also forward-looking, making sure that we can generate the evidence that will be needed by the policymaker at the time they will need to take a decision. Thanks so much, uh, Nia again. I would like now to uh, give the floor to uh, Ms. Rodora Alde, who is the Director of Policy Development and Planning Bureau at the Department of Social Welfare and Development in the Philippines. Uh, Ms. Rodora, um, the question for you is, how is the Philippines government using the evidence that you know, we, we, we look at and we included in the book to inform the drafting of the Philippine Social Protection Plan and the, generally speaking on the social protection floor in the Philippines? Ms. Rodora, um, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, um, Andrea. So good afternoon from the Philippines. So first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, UNICEF for this uh, book launching. So I would say that the timing couldn't be more perfect, given that it has provided evidence on how social protection measures can uh, temporarily ease up or alleviate the impact of the pandemic on poverty. And definitely, um, this can inform the current draft of the Philippines Social Protection Plan in terms of uh, identifying what should be our key strategic priorities. I mean to say the national government priorities on social protection. So the uh, proposed social protection plan currently focuses on three areas. First is the implementation of the social protection floor, which is, has been uh, recently adopted by the national government. And then of course, the, the, the next uh, focus area is on the development of adaptive and shock responsive social protection. And on the th our third focused area is on the modernization of the current social protection delivery system in the Philippines. So um, the, as I have mentioned, the SP floor has already been adopted by the national government and that it contains the nationally defined minimum guarantees which include access to essential health care, uh, including uh, maternity care, basic income security for persons in active age, uh, basic income security for uh, older persons. And of course, um, what we're talking about now is uh, about basic income security for children. As I have said, the timing of the release of this study could not have been more perfect. 
uh, the ex ante micro simulations actually are supporting the medium term recommendations of the social protection floor, which is to move towards a progressive coverage of four piece to all qualified children. That is go beyond uh, enrolling uh, uh, the three uh, enrolling three children under Pantawi. And that of course would also address um, the recommendation to cover child grants uh, for ages zero to two. But I think the challenge uh, to implement this recommendation is that because um, there are legal impediments, you know, the our our uh, Pantawid law, if I'm not mistaken, I've, I, I tried to read it before I, I joined the webinar. It did not mention any limitation on the number of children to be enrolled or monitored. Therefore, really, the challenge is on the tight fiscal space that we have. And as I've mentioned earlier by uh, Nyasha, if I uh, pronounce it correctly, I think we really need more evidence. I, I, I think the evidence that we need right now is on the sustainable financing options and how are we going to finance the progressive implementation of the social protection floor. And actually, this is also one of our key activities or key areas in the social protection plan and how are we going to really um, what's the fiscal space for all the new programs or the expansion of the key uh, social protection programs that uh, we are going to implement for the next six years? Um, and then, of course, uh, on, on, the, um, on the recommendations, uh, I think the policy recommendations uh, presented support our goal in the determination or in designing uh, the key elements to make our existing programs more adaptive and shock responsive. So I have noted that the response uh, should be adequate to the shock and it should not only address the current crisis, but help them easily transition to early recovery, if not address our uh, future vulnerabilities. So in, um, th this requires that we should really address the adequacy of benefits and uh, increased coverage of social protection programs. And uh, it is one of the uh, specific agenda of the successor SP plan. So the, the recommendations actually affirms our plan to move towards a more robust uh, targeting system. Actually, the, the uh, pandemic has taught, uh, has we really learned a lot of lessons about targeting during the time of pandemic. And now um, hopefully with our um, digital transformation agenda, we can now move towards a more robust uh, targeting system, uh, introduced on-demand applications and dynamic social uh, registries. So we can easily identify vulnerable groups to be covered by the programs and deliver the benefits when they need it the most. So I hope there will be no more delay with the, with the adoption of the digital technologies in the delivery of social protection systems. So to sum up, I think the evidence from this study would help build our confidence, DSWD in particular, uh, to push for reforms, knowing that it is driven by data. And of course, uh, it can help us identify the key strategies, the ones that are more pragmatic, doable, and axiomatic as we move towards universal social protection through SP, flo SP floor and adapt adaptive and shock responsive approach. So I would end here, Andrea, over to you. Thank you so much, Rodora. Uh, really, really uh, to the point uh, uh, presentation. And I think that's uh, that's one of the example uh, of the use of proper of, uh, of the evidence and how much the component of research is important in the Philippines. And also the idea that you know, there are areas, particularly when we go into the adaptive social protection, the uh, shock response to social protection, the level of information that we need to collect and also the challenges that you know in developing strong evidence is uh, uh, addressed by our colleague in uh, in Philippines. So thanks again for that, and again also thanks uh, to the colleagues in the UNICEF uh, Philippines office that are working so closely uh, with the government. Uh, the next speaker, I'm very happy to have with us Professor Samchai Kitshon, who is the research director of inclusive development at the Thailand Development Research Institute and uh, a great, I would say, partners and allies of uh, the work that UNICEF is doing uh, in Thailand. And so I also want to compliment and thanks all the colleagues uh, at the UNICEF Thailand office. Uh, Professor um, Samchai, we look at, uh, uh, we, we ask, we'd like to ask you, how does academia contribute to the strengthening of Thailand's social protection system? 
what specific research collaboration or partnership exists or should be promoted between academia and government agencies to inform policies and program development. Professor Samchai, it is a pleasure to give you a floor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Andrea, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, also, I would like to I would like to thank UNICEF uh, for having me um, this afternoon. Um, I think the question, yeah, the keyword of the question is about collaboration and partnership between academia, um, and and to make it uh, to make sure that the policy, the, the good policy, actually uh, does happen. Um, I think it's probably not a bad idea for me to share my personal experience. I'll tell you all how I went through um, in trying to um, uh, make sure that uh, the good policy uh, did happen um, and, 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 and draw the conclusion or draw the, uh, some sort of, uh, of, of, of the lesson from, from my own experience. Um, let me just first by, uh, talk briefly about uh, my own background. I'm, I'm not purely academia. Um, I'm actually working with a think tank um, called TDI. Um, TDI uh, focusing on doing the so-called policy research, not a basic research. So our clients are mostly government agencies or sometimes uh, in the international organization like UNICEF, the World Bank, or UDP. Um, so that's my background. So you, uh, you can see that I'm always in the area of uh, making sure that um, uh, the research get implemented um, um, can be translated into the good policy. Um, my very first um, uh, research on the social protection uh, date back to about 50 years ago. Um, at that time, there was um, um, a request from the then prime minister at that time about 15 years ago. He had the idea of, he, had, he, he asked the question, is it possible for Thailand to have a so-called um, a comprehensive uh, social protection for everyone, cover, covering everyone from the um, from from uh, from birth to death. Um, he posed this question to um, uh, some of the minister, and and it, it so happened that I was assigned. Uh, I was asked to do uh, this kind of research. So uh, that 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 was uh, what I did. So I basically uh, went through all the social uh, protection available in Thailand, and 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 try to um, uh, analyze is there any gaps in terms of uh, what, what should happen and, and but, but still um, is not there at that time. Um, so I finished the research and then uh, some one, one of the key conclusion from that research was, was that um, Thailand can afford it. I mean, uh, we can cover everyone um, from birth to death uh, we probably need to increase the tax somewhat, but not that high, but not, uh, not that much. Um, so I, pre um, I present um, this research to many people, obviously to the government. Um, unfortunately, one of the, one of the very uh, 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 key reason I learned um, during that time was that it's also depend on political view. I mean, the then Prime Minister has this idea but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that everybody agree with him. Uh, I had a, um, an opportunity to present this idea to his party. He is not there, but uh, all the key members of his party uh, uh, was there. After I finished uh, presenting, I, the, the question I, I, was, uh, I was asked, or uh, some of the warning I was, I was warned is that, well, uh, you, can, you can say anything you want about uh, raising, uh, um, uh, making the social protection more comprehensive, but please do not talk about a uh, tax increase. That was uh, that was a uh, that uh, that that was uh, the last one. I also has an opportunity to present to to the next government. Um, I was rejected. Also, um, the reason is is simply uh, that that government um, they they rely on the so called populist policy. They are not. They do not have. Um, uh, they they do not like the idea of the social protection, they, they just want to focus on the populist policy. So I was rejected. So that was the uh, one of the really painful lesson that I learned. After that, um, I start um, doing research on children, uh, uh, mostly with UNICEF, starting from the multi-dimensional uh, poverty index for children, and then for the child support plan, and, and, and so move on to the disability uh, for, for children as well. Um, 
the reason, um, uh, the lesson I learned from this is that um, you can generate evidence which can be used um, to push the policy. For example, for the child support plan, uh, two of the very important uh, key findings from, from the research is the impact, is the impact of the child support. It, it so happened that um, the child support plan did have a positive impact on nutrition intake on, 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 on the, on the uh, access to the medical service. Um, at the same time, uh, because that uh, the program uh, uh, was targeting and it is still targeting um, even now, um, the, the, the research found 30% exclusion alert. These two um, evidence has been used in the past four or five years really extensively. For example, the exclusion, of, um, exclusion alert of 30% has been used um, widely um, from, um, um, during, um, uh, for the media. Uh, many media cover this. Um, many civil society um, came to me and asked for this evidence, and they used the evidence to push um, to the government to make the child support can you do so, citing that 30% is too much, is too high. Um, the reason, I think that one of the lessons that, that I draw from this is that why this 30% exclusion is so well accepted. I think um, there's a two reasons. One, one, the, uh, one reason is that um, because Thailand is aging very, uh, very fast. So basically when you are aging very, uh, very fast, you tend to put a high value on children. So 30% of exclusion is uh, exclusion alerts uh, become unacceptable. The other thing is, I think is, is probably because at the same time, there was the idea of leave no one behind. Um, promoted by, by, by the UN organization. So uh, what, what we did is that, well, we combined the 30% um, exclusion alert uh, to say that, well, this is, uh, this is not um, uh, consistent with the idea of leave no one behind because 30% of the poor children are still left behind. So this is a uh, well, well taken. And, and also um, many government agencies also accept this, um, some political parties, some major political party, including the one uh, which is about to set the new government, uh, really, really well accept this idea. And they use this result um, um, uh, in the election campaign to say that, well, now is no targeting anymore. It must be universal because universality is, is, the, is the approach that um, ensure that there will be no exclusion alert. So this is how the evidence has been used. Um, into the actual policy. Let me just say briefly about um, the, the, my, my experience on, on, on truly advocating um, um, uh, evidence. Uh, yes, we, we do evidence, um, but the things that we, we, we need to keep in mind is that we have to um, disseminate the evidence as widely as possible. And, 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 and at the same time, try to um, uh, uh, make it or present this in a very punchy way. Um, for example, you don't talk too much. I mean, you just um, select some two or three sentences, which um, um, probably, for example, the media want, 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 to, want, to put, want to put in their headline. Those are this kind of, of a thing. Um, the other lesson that I learned from, from, from doing advocacy is that you need to, when you talk to people, you need to probably understand the background of the people that you are going to talk, talk to. For example, I had the experience of um, presenting the evidence to many ministers in Thailand. Um, every time I try to um, get to know him um, 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 uh, from the beginning, what kind of person he is, uh, uh, what is his value system? Is there any concern politically or, 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 or something else that he has in mind? Um, we have to prepare this um, because the um, uh, our, uh, 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 um, a same evidence can be can be can be can be spoken out differently. It depends on how you use your uh, your word carefully. For example, uh, at one time, I um, uh, speak to a very uh, high official um, from the from the for the national agency, and and happen to know that um, just two days ago he himself posted a Facebook um, uh, mentioning the leave the world behind. So when I, when I met him, I, um, I repeat on this, uh, this word really, really um, uh, several times just to make sure that he actually get the idea. So um, this is pretty much what I have to share, um, um, what, what I can share now. You can draw the lesson from yourself. 
um, um, I, I, I do some, some, uh, some lesson and, and present, but um, the remaining up to you. So I cannot stop here. Uh, thank you very much, and Andrea. Thank you so much, Professor Samchai. Really, really, really fascinating. I think the, the key message of understanding that the production of the research and the use of the research are linked. And actually, they, thinking about the use and the users of our research should shape the way we do research. So it's not just producing whatever we like and then eventually trying to find a way to disseminate and make advocacy as the, the other way around. I have been a clear understanding on who will be the one, uh, the target of our, of our research, what is the right message, what is the right information that can uh, really uh, change uh, uh, their opinion or shape the policy decision is a critical one. So how the research formulation, advocacy, policy use is part of the same process and are not processes that, you know, we have experts doing the research and then we have experts doing communication and then somebody else would take care of our of our evidence. Uh, and the example of uh, of Thailand is a very, very good one, particularly the example you provided on the exclusion error is a, is a fantastic one. The exclusion error sometimes is perceived as a pure statistical kind of numbers, but if we are able to tell what is the real story of that number, that is what really can make a difference. So thanks again for, for this uh, uh, contribution and thanks again for the work that you're doing together with the colleague of UNICEF Thailand. I would like now to ask uh, a question now to move uh, uh, to Cambodia, and I would like to ask uh, uh, a question to Mr. Rexmay, who is the Director of Social Assistance Department at the General Secretary for National Social Protection Council. And the idea is to see how the evidence uh, played a role in shaping the design of the Cambodia Families Package. If you can elaborate on specific research finding or data that influence the decision-making process based on your experience. Uh, Mr. Uh, Rexmay, you have the floor. Thank you, Andrea. And first, let me say good morning and good afternoon or good evening to everyone around the world. And thank you for having me in this important webinar today. Uh, before answering the question, let me take this chance uh, thanking uh, UNICEF, especially Andrea, and congratulate uh, UNICEF for, have, uh, for launching this book. Uh, I also would like to thank my, my co-author, uh, including Dr. Chonaret, uh, who is the Secretary General for the General Secretariat for the National Social Protection Council of Cambodia, uh, Peksha uh, from the Economic Policy Research Institute, and also the two uh, colleagues from UNICEF Cambodia, Erna Riba and Sawanri, for contributing to uh, having uh, this article about the Cambodia family package. Uh, not just the article itself, but also the development of family package in Cambodia. Uh, so let me start by uh, giving you a brief background about the development of social protection in Cambodia. So before, prior 2018, uh, Cambodia social protection system is still a small and very fragmented system. Uh, there are many social protection uh, programs and schemes, uh, but the scopes and coverage were limited and scattered around, implemented by many different uh, government institutions, um, but there is no proper system. Uh, the identification uh, approach is also different, uh, and this creates a lot of operational inefficiencies. So after the adoption of National Social Protection Policy Framework 2016, 2025 in uh, 2017, uh, the establishment of National Social Protection Council of Cambodia uh, is the turning point of the development of social protection system in Cambodia. So this uh, council, this national council, were established with one mission is to steer the development and the reform of Cambodia's social protection system. So after the uh, adoption, uh, the establishment of this council, uh, social protection system development in Cambodia is accelerated. And in June 2019, uh, the first uh, national scale cash transfer program for pregnant women and children under two uh, from a poor household were established. Uh, I would like 
I, I would like to say that this is a flagship, a national flagship program. Uh, why? Uh, because this program, the system of this program is digitalized uh, using a MIS system, and the payment is also made digitally via Wing Bank. And by having uh, this uh, program, this national flagship program, there are more social assistance programs established using the same modality, using the same system. So this program uh, actually uh, provide a foundation to advance social assistance uh, system in, in Cambodia. So with, with this establishment of, uh, uh, with, by having this uh, national uh, flagship program, uh, Cambodia is able to respond to COVID-19 pandemic and in 2020. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, the government of Cambodia decided to respond to this shock uh, by establishing an emergency cash transfer program for poor and vulnerable household with the purpose to support the livelihood of this household uh, during the time of shock. So at the time, uh, the ID poor system so Cambodia has a system to identify poor and vulnerable household as a target group uh, for social assistance, uh, for social assistance intervention by the government. So it the, the identification system, the ID poor system, will shift from a regular three-year round uh, to on-demand approach. So with this the coverage of social assistance, the coverage of the system uh, expand, expanded. Uh, and as of now, it's over around 700,000 poor and vulnerable households. So with this, the government is able to provide a cash transfer, an emergency cash transfer to those poor and vulnerable households during the pandemic. And the program itself were intended to be, uh, intend to be a short-term emergency program. But as of now, it has been implemented for 35 months already. And the total budget uh, spending is more than 1,000 million USD. So why I, I provide you a brief background about uh, this development? Because this leads to the development of family package in Cambodia. So with the ambition to tackle the issue of fragmentation of social assistance programs, and also to provide uh, support uh, the livelihood of poor and vulnerable with the intention to continue providing uh, support the livelihood of poor and vulnerable household following life cycle approach after this emergency uh, program to uh, as a short response to covid-19 the uh, council the national the national social protection council of cambodia has the vision to pro, uh, to create a uh, fam to create this family package so what is family package uh, of Cambodia? So the, the family package is a integration of four social assistance program. So the first program is the national flagship program, cash transfer for pregnant women and children under two from poor and vulnerable household. Uh, there is also another cash transfer program for children in primary and secondary school as scholarship, cash scholarship. And cash transfer for person with disability and cash transfer for elderly. So this, this uh, family package has these four main uh, program that will be integrated and using a unified uh, system and approach and procedure. So before these four program are implemented separately by different uh, operator uh, government agency using different system, but with the establishment of family package, these four programs will be using uh, implemented uh, uh, um, will be implemented using a uniform uh, system and procedure, and will be managed and implemented by a single operator, which is the National Social Assistance Fund. So this uh, this institution uh, is established to operate social assistance program. Uh, this family package, like I mentioned earlier, it, it is intended uh, to be a long-term social assistance framework. Uh, I call it framework because it's a combination of four programs uh, that is uh, continue from the shop response cash transfer program. So how, so let me uh, give you uh, more information on how we use evidence uh, to 
design this family package. So to come up with the design of this family package, there were uh, many process of evidence generation uh, were conducted and incorporated where applicable. Uh, we, with the support from UNICEF, uh, I actually did not do all this uh, study and analysis, uh, frankly speaking. It was conducted jointly with many uh, experts uh, and also consultation with national uh, stakeholder, government agency, but also a development partner. So one of the analysis that we did that contribute uh, to the design of family package is a comprehensive risk and vulnerability assessment in Cambodia using socioeconomic data, but also demographic health and household data. So with this, we know uh, and we generate a lot of evidence on the risk and the reason uh, how, uh, why household become poor uh, and also who are the vulnerable groups that needs government support. We also conduct a social assistance system analysis in Cambodia to see the gaps, the coverage gaps, and also the challenges in the system to see where it needs to be tackled. And also we look at the regional and global practices, uh, global best practice in uh, social assistance, especially on uh, the integration of uh, program and also at the operational level of the uh, social assistance program. So with these two jointly, uh, we actually, uh, these two uh, uh, analysis and um, cross-reference with best practices, we can come up with the design of family package at the operational level, including targeting process, uh, enrollment process, uh, MIS systems and grievance system and also m and &E. Uh, we also conducted a wide uh, national wide stakeholder consultation uh, with government agency development partners uh, and other uh, experts for their opinion on the design of the family package and we incorporate all inputs and at the end uh, the last process that we did uh, is incorporating the lesson learned uh, from the implementation of cash transfer during COVID-19. So this uh, implementation uh, of uh, cash uh, short response cash transfer program also provide us a lot of lesson learned, the experience uh, and also what uh, we have learned uh, from the implementation that was put uh, especially on the support of vulnerable group like person with disability, uh, children and the two uh, elderly and other aspects like uh, people living with HIV, etc. So with that lesson learned, it's also put into the design of uh, this family package. Uh, moreover, uh, this is over the uh, the book uh, because the this article and the book was uh, back in, uh, the process was back in 2020, 2020. but uh, recently uh, with the support from UNICEF, uh, the NSPC also uh, conduct a process evaluation of the cash transfer program for pregnant women and children under two. And one of the recommendations from that uh, uh, evaluation is to increase the benefit value of the transfer. I think this piece of evidence uh, to double the benefit value because the, the finding was that uh, the, the current benefit value is not enough, it's not adequate. So with this piece of evidence, the government actually decides to increase or to double the benefit of this cash transfer program. And this also affects the design of family package uh, because family uh, because uh, one of uh, this cash transfer is one of the program. There are also many other actual evidence I could uh, describe, uh, like the reason why uh, to why school children drops out and how to retain uh, school children in secondary schools. Uh, that's why uh, with that piece of evidence, uh, the scholarship program, the cash scholarship program, uh, will be implemented uh, nationally uh, because uh, we understand that there is a need to provide cash transfer for children who are attending a class in primary and secondary schools. Um, and that, uh, so I, I, I could actually uh, provide you know, more piece of, uh, pieces of evidence um, that leads to the design of family package. 
uh, but I, I I would stop here for the time uh, matter because Andrea already opened his video signaling that time is up. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it took so long. But uh, oh. lastly, uh, just just would like to uh, say that this family package uh, now since the cash transfer for poor uh, vulnerable during COVID-19 is still on. This family, the implementation of family package in Cambodia is still pending because like I mentioned earlier, this family package is the continuation of the shock response program as a permanent social assistance program. So the design is shifting, uh, uh, shifting uh, recently as well. Like I mentioned earlier, the increase of benefit value, the consideration of having a floor, et cetera, is still ongoing. Uh, we are at the final stage, actually, we have a framework, uh, but with this recent development, uh, we believe that after when the implementation of family package, we will reach all vulnerable, poor and vulnerable household and groups to support their livelihood uh, so that they could enjoy this uh, government uh, social assistance benefit. So thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lexman. Really, really interesting case for Cambodia. I think also the idea of how to shift in for an emergency response to become a systematic one and which level of knowledge and uh, and research we have to link on that one is a, is a critical one. Definitely we see more and more happening. Uh, also looking at uh, how the incredible expansion of social protection program that we had uh, um, during the COVID period, now that we are entering into the kind of time of consolidation, also to measure if you're really going back backwards where we were three years ago, or if this experience of this emergency, this crisis, in a way left something better. So we are building better our social protection system. Thank you so much again for a, a great example uh, from uh, Cambodia. And now, last but definitely not least, uh, I'm very happy to give the floor to Felicity O'Brien, who is the Assistant Director for Social Protection of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, DFAT of the Government of Australia, uh, one of an incredible partner uh, in social protection in the region, a uh, great player, also UNICEF, but with, with governments and many other partners. And we would like to, to hear more about what our strategies and initiatives have the Australian Do the Department of Foreign Affairs implemented to promote evidence-based decision-making and the utilization of research and knowledge in strengthening social protection system across, mm -hmm. across Asia and Pacific. Felicity, it's a real pleasure to give you the floor. Thanks so much, Andrea. And um, first of all, um, I'd like to say congratulations to UNICEF as well on the launch of um, your um, report, Evidence to Action, um, looking really forward to digging into it. And it's been really great to listen to the insights from all the other speakers um, today. <clears throat> so just um, starting at the agency level, um, Australia will be um, delivering a new development um, policy um, which is going to be released in the coming months. So in that policy, we're going to have quite an elevated focus on climate change, recognising that climate change is the single greatest threat to the livelihood, security and well-being of people across our region, particularly um, in the Pacific. So to be on the front foot, we commissioned some um, research um, that I wanted to talk about um, first up. Um, and we, um, you know, kind of have taken this approach um, that we need to really acknowledge where our knowledge gaps are and make sure that we're tapping into the global experts to um, and collaborating with others to make sure that we have, um, you know, good um, research and evidence to inform all the work that we do going forward in the social protection space, but even more broadly across the work of um, DFAT itself. So um, this research was undertaken by Anna McCord and Cecilia Costello, who um, I know a lot of you um, have worked with in the past and you would know them well. And it's called the Climate Change and Social Protection Asia Pacific Region Research and Advisory Project. So the key messages coming out of this um, um, you know, research are that, and, and the things that we do kind of really know, but um, it's really great to have this, this evidence that we can, can share across the region. Um, and and we, we see that climate change is going to profoundly reshape the social and economic risks that people are facing, particularly the next generation, our children are going to be in a really precarious situation as poverty and vulnerability in our region increase as a result of climate impacts. 
So the Asia Pacific regions we know are um, top of the list with the World Index um, reports on um, disaster risk, and they're particularly susceptible and vulnerable to climate change impacts. But at the same time, our region is also really lagging with the development of our social protection systems. So social protection coverage remains pretty low across um, the region um, and excluding China, 70% of the population across the region don't have any access to social protection systems at all or any kind of coverage. So with the spike that we're going to see in humanitarian and um, climate related disasters combined with the increases in protracted crisis. That means the need for social protection and social safety nets across the region is going to increase substantially. So as social protection actors, we need to think about what this transition means for us um, and how we can protect the growing numbers of people from climate induced poverty including the new groups that are going to be vulnerable based on where they live, on their geography. And, um, you know, for example, if they're living in an area where um, there's a decreased access to natural resources such as um, fresh water. So all of this is going to have extreme implications for the work that we all do. So the report, the report you know, really did highlight for us that um, the current vision of social protection is starting to look a bit inadequate to meet um, that projected future um, kind of needs um, and, and the emerging risks that we're seeing. And it also really highlighted for us the gaps that we have in our knowledge. We don't know what works in this area yet and we need to start um, working on gathering that evidence across the region and globally. Um, we also need to collaborate with um, climate change, disaster risk reduction, humanitarian actors and others to um, you know, address this like multi-sectoral wicked problem that, um, that we're encountering as um, a society. On um, the upside though, social protection can be like used as a really good tool to support with us transitioning to the green economy. So it's not all doom and gloom, <laughs> but um, the findings of the, the report are really profound. Um, we hope to share them with everyone pretty soon. Um, but one thing that we um, um, wanted to really get out of um, commissioning this research was using it as an advocacy piece to build those relationships with the actors that we are going to have to work with, both within our agency in DFAT, but also more broadly across the region and then globally. Um, so we need to increase our knowledge in this area. I think we really all do. And um, including how you know these are going to impact on children and future generations it's it's really you know a, a, like I said a wicked problem that we really need to get our heads around so we hope to share some of the initial findings of this research over the coming months um so watch this space so another area um that we um you know work on quite a bit is trying to inform our work on on social inclusion and that obviously has has major implications across all the work of um you know, our agency, but also for social protection. So there are significant gaps in the global evidence around exclusion and poverty, and particularly for our region, as Andrea has mentioned in his presentation earlier. So even around identifying who is poor um, and other sort of social level data um, from national surveys can be really patchy. And over COVID, we know that, you know, that, um, you know, was, was even more the case that, you um, National surveys were put on hold and things like that. Um, those national surveys also collect um, data at that household level. So we always have problems with that and trying to unpack what that means for everyone who lives in that household. Um, the gender impacts and also those impacts for children living within that household. So that sort of um, household level data from census and health income and expenditure surveys um, does inform things like the multidimensional poverty index. But like I said, it's household level data. You know, we can't really get down to that intra-household level to see what's happening. We, we know that evidence and data is really important. It assists all of us. And we've heard from government officials, academics on how it really assists us to make good choices and inform our thinking, um, and, you know, our responses to social policy issues, including social protection. 
So um, across um, DFAT more broadly, we try and play a role in supporting um, national and regional efforts around improving data collection. And um, that includes supporting collection of data around education and health um, outcomes for children as well. Um, you know, it can be kind of tricky um, in some of the contexts we work in. We have like, you know, small populations, which means that we have small government agencies to work with and collecting this kind of data at a national level is really expensive. So, you know, there's limitations and, and barriers with collecting this data that we're kind of thinking through all the time. Um, and during COVID, um, as some of um, our other speakers have talked about, we all had to pivot to those sort of online and remote forms of data collection and research. Um, and this did provide us with some innovations and opportunities, but it also then raised some questions around things like ethical research and taking do no harm approaches and issues around um, engaging in um, good research practice and not um, undertaking extractive research, for example. Um, so it also raised questions for us within DFAT um, around, and, and it's something that we all grapple with um, and have for a long time around how we can better utilise local experts and empower local leadership around the research agenda. Um, and that includes collecting data for, for children. So that, that it has been quite difficult over COVID when we're kind of... Um, pivoting to those more online sort of forms of data collection you know often it's not appropriate to um, collect data from children um, using those those kind of uh, methodologies um, on um, the DFAT website um, a few years ago we did develop some ethical research guidelines which are up on the DFAT website if you're interested in having a look at those I'm um, just quickly summing up and um, I just wanted to share with you an example of um, a tool that um, DFAT has um, supported over about 10 years now. So it's called Equality Insights at the moment. And this is a survey tool that builds on the work of the International Women's Development Agency and the Australian National University. And it was initiated about 10 years ago. Um, DFAT has been funding it um, since then. And um, it's a tool that helps us to um, unpack how poverty is experienced at that intra-household level. So, uh, um, you know, it helps us to also enter um, what the gender and poverty story looks like at that intra-household level, how resources are distributed and how this um, situation sort of impacts on children as well. So a survey was developed. Um, it covers off on 15 dimensions of poverty um, and those 15 dimensions were determined through a research project which um, spoke with people who have lived experience of living in poverty from around the region and the tool was piloted quite extensively over the last 10 years. Um, so the tool is multi-dimensional, it's intersectional, it collects individual level data for all household members over the age of 18. It's gender sensitive and it also captures the situation for children within the household too. So there are questions in there around education, health, shelter, sanitation and relationships in the household. Um, the COVID-19 context, again, required us to, um, in fact, to pivot this um, tool so that it was a shorter phone-based survey um, which enables remote data collection, but it provides um, policy rich data and um, the team ensure that data collected is accessible to a range of government and non-government stakeholders um, in the Pacific. So um, it's being utilised by governments and, and donors and even NGOs across the region. Um, so summing up, um, although these examples are pretty high level around how we try and undertake inclusive research to build our knowledge and understanding and plug those gaps that we have, we need to continue to collaborate and um, share our evidence um, with other partners. Um, having good evidence is, is really also useful as an advocacy tool at times, um, especially when you need to win the hearts and minds of decision makers. Um, at times though, it, it really is a non-negotiable. Um, we need it to enable us to make sound and informed decisions about social protection policy and programming. Also being quite humble that we can't know everything about social protection systems and social policy and the lived experience of people on the ground. So we really do need to tap into 
the expertise of others to um, bring all this together to make sure that our policy and our practice and our programming, our advice to others is sound. So, um, and also to do that, that needs to really be informed by an understanding of people's needs and the lived experience of people on the ground so that we can provide appropriate responses and support um, to our partner countries and others um, across the region. Back to you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Really, really fascinating and inspiring intervention, particularly the call on the collaboration, I think is a critical one for this part of the region. Competences, expertise is that. And also the fact that nobody can know everything. So I really, I really like that call. Uh, but also the, the very good thinking in terms of uh, what social protection is addressing in this region is highly dynamic, is highly changing. You made the example of the climate change, but also the economic crisis that is happening here. It requires us to think how we can have uh, research that is able to give answers at the time that the change happened and not only after five years as we were used in the past when the world was different and uh, our survey were enough to give uh, us information for policy decision. Now we need something more dynamic. We need to have something that is more related, link it to the exclusion to look at what, who are the population that are systematically excluded or are more hidden and more difficult to reach. And also I really like the, the, the idea that doing research, doing evidence cannot be detached from the thinking about the way we do it. So the ethics on, on the way, the challenges and the solution, and sometimes the hard decision have to take when we develop research. Again, is a fascinating intervention and always a great partner for the region, not only for UNICEF, but for many partners, governments and uh, UN organization and, and NGOs in the region. So thanks again uh, for, for that felicity. I would like now to, uh, open up, uh, I give uh, uh, some time to two colleagues, to uh, Niasha and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Samchai, just to, to give some reflection on uh, uh, this, uh, uh, or some of these uh, presentations. Um, Niasha, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrea. So I would like to thank uh, Ms. Rodora Aude for that insightful and interesting presentation on how the Philippines government is using the evidence presented in chapter 11 of the book to inform you know, the drafting of the Philippines social protection plan and especially establishing the social protection floor. So um, I have two reflections uh, to that uh, presentation. So first, I think it is good to see that the government is investing in not only increasing coverage, but also the adequacy of social protection responses to shocks and also future vulnerabilities. I think that one key finding from chapter 11 in the book is that the social ameliori amelioration program, uh, which is one of the social protection programs in the Philippines, it, it provided temporary relief for beneficiaries during the COVID-19 pandemic, but could not adequately protect beneficiaries from the full economic impact or help beneficiaries re reduce the use of adverse uh, coping strategies. So adequacy is, is, a, is a crucial factor for ensuring the effectiveness of social protection programs, but even more importantly, for ensuring that social protection responses to shocks are effective. And um, in the evidence that is available so far, um, collected from you know, other regions, um, the evidence shows that the value of any social protection benefit um, should adequately meet the needs of children and families. And more importantly, it should be responsive to inflation. So that is a crit critical aspect uh, that many governments should consider when they're trying to increase the adequacy of social protection responses to shock shocks. My second reaction, uh, second reflection is, um, is on the on the on the discussion around the implementation of progressive implementation of the national social protection flaws. I think that uh, Ms. Alde mentioned that uh, the Philippines government is prioritizing um, increasing or promoting basic income security for children. And I think one of the good things, uh, and I think as she alluded to, the simulations that were done in, in chapter 11 of the book compared different policy options and 
one of those options was the grant, the child grant for children under the, the age of two years. And from those simulations, the evidence shows that it was uh, one of the most effective for, for reducing poverty. And so it, it really, it, it, I, it's, it's encouraging to see that the Philippine government is thinking about ways of prioritizing the introduction of such a benefit for children. And just one last point I want to make on, on the issue of sustainable financing, uh, which uh, has been noted as something that is important, but also in the face of fiscal space con constraints, there is need for evidence to, to guide governments on this. So I can only point to several options that are available so far from the research that has been done. So we have found that options that governments could consider for finding fiscal space include the reallocation of public expenditures, increasing tax revenues, um, managing debt, eliminating illicit financial flaws, and you know, also lobbying for aid and transfers. So I will stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Niasha, and uh, the very good comments. And then also during the Q&A, if you have a chance also for, for the colleague from the Philippines to respond. Uh, Professor Samchai, over to you. Uh, just briefly, um, I have a, um, a couple of reflections on this. First of all, I like, I think I, I want to uh, comment on the progress made by many countries in the region in progressing the social protection, um, both in terms of coverage, in terms of the adequacy. I particularly like um, the example from, from both Philippines and Cambodia. I think that they, they both um, uh, represent um, uh, two countries where the progress has been made. Um, uh, really um, uh, uh, satisfactory. Um, the other reflection I want to touch upon what um, uh, Felicity uh, mentioned about um, the, the idea that the social protection need to be able to respond to the, to, to the crisis um, um, more adequately than before. I think that this, this is really important because the world is more and more uncertain. Um, we have so many uncertainty, the world is woke up. So um, the, the quick response to, to the future crisis is really important. Um, to do this, to accomplish this, uh, we need uh, both the data. I think that one of the, the comments in, in, in the Q&A um, uh, mentioned about uh, the need to establish a so-called uh, like a, a unique IT uh, database. Whereas um, 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 the government can know almost all the time on a real time basis who is doing what, who is receiving what in terms of the social protection. And this also moved to the, the, also the, 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 the idea of uh, what kind of data we are going to use. Um, the national survey can be a very good one. We have been using that um, for, 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 for quite some time. But um, um, the, the shortcoming of the national survey is that it tends to be. Um, too late. Um, you need time to collect data. You need time to decide the to, to uh, decide the uh, decide the question, uh, for example, and then you need time to analyze this. Um, we should continue doing that, but uh, make the process uh, a shorter, um, make the process more more responsive, and also at the same time, we should also try to utilize more and more of the so-called administrative data, uh, just the big data, the real-time data. I think that, um, and I think that uh, that led to, to to the question in the Q and A that um, if we can somehow establish the unique ID database, um, which collect data almost on a real time basis, that would be very very helpful. Um, this is um, this is my reflection. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sam Chai. Um, particularly the last the last part is uh, is a critical one because we are moving to. Uh, from one side, we want to make sure that we have chances to use uh, the fact that uh, admin data and existing data are better in quality and also better in access and also better in quantity. So the possibility to use um, big data and administrative data is a huge potential, including the idea of the unique identifiers. And at the same time, how we can, uh, following also what Felicity was mentioned before, how we can protect uh, the uh, uh, the identity, but in a way, the the ethical approach of big data, when uh, data are collected about people to a level that almost people don't know about it, so that they cannot even give the consent. So definitely, the new frontiers um, uh, for social for social protection and data are incredible in terms of the potential, 
we can really get information, almost real time information that uh, by governments to provide the right uh, response at the right time. And at the same time, open up, as always, uh, new questions that we, we have to ask our, ourselves to put together not only the efficiency of our intervention, but also the protection of the rights of the people starting, for example, particularly for children uh, in all uh, in all the system that we create. Thank you so much again, uh, uh, Professor Samchai. And now I'm, I'm very happy to uh, to introduce for our final remarks, um, uh, Natalia, who is our Chief of Social Policy in uh, headquarter, in UNICEF headquarters. Uh, and thanks so much for being with us so early in the morning. Uh, it's far away, uh, New York, uh, in terms of time zone from uh, Bangkok. Um, but Natalia, um, over to you and welcome to this, uh, uh, to this uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Andrea. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, colleagues. Uh, really, many thanks for the invitation, for the opportunity to be part of this uh, webinar and very important launch. Um, I wish I was there in person with, with you, um, but at least we can be connected via, via Zoom. Um, let me start by really um, extending my sincere congratulations to the editors, to the team of authors, to all everybody that was behind this very important and timely publication that without doubt is a very important uh, milestone for the region. I think it definitely contributes to continue to consolidate the wealth and the breadth of the evidence and experience that exists at regional and country level, providing very you know, specific considerations for the regions, for the challenges that we are all trying to, to address. But also because it highlights, I think, some of the also important critical design and implementation considerations that in many cases, as we all know, have made the difference in terms of impact, in terms of scale, and in terms of innovation of social protection programs. And if I may add, really a, a publication that I uh, particularly appreciate because it brings together the perspectives and experiences of many parts of, of, um, of what it entails to have a good research program, which is researchers, of course, but also policymakers helping to identify the best uh, and more relevant research and the multiple stakeholders that contribute contribute to the success of the programs. And I think that is a big part of, of how we manage to make um, evidence more, more um, relevant and, and impactful. I think that for, for many years, uh, UNICEF and, and partners have uh, definitely prioritized the development of a very solid and rigorous evidence base to inform our work and our support to social protection and, and to really make sure that what we are um, doing and have the way that we are enhancing uh, the way the governments are prioritizing social protection is, is based on evidence, is based on critical experience, and, and on the context-specific design that is needed to make um, systems work. Uh, but also, I think, and I guess specific to this sector, the evidence has had to look not only at impact, at cost effectiveness, at broad results, but many times had to also help to address some of the policy concerns, some of the myths, some of the misperceptions that unfortunately continue to exist around social protection programs and systems. And I, uh, I was able to, to hear some of the reflections on, on that in the previous uh, presentations. I really want to believe that um, our, our work around COVID, the response that as a, a society had to embark in terms of the socioeconomic impacts of COVID, and the specific role that social protection played in that response is helping a little bit to change the narrative um, alongside the very important evidence that we have across regions, including in, in Asia. In other words, showing that social protection is not a handout, is not a disincentive to labor, um, is not only necessary in terms of crises, um, uh, or it is just a band-aid, but it's something that is critical, a critical pillar for resilience, a critical pillar for risk management, um, really helping families to survive, to uh, withstand shocks, to manage risks a bit more effectively, um, and to you know limit the impossible choices between taking care of kids or investing in their own economies and livelihoods. Um, I, I really hope that that we're changing that, and and I think you know our experiences together with alongside this very important and, and new evidence is, is I think helping to shape that 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 um, changing narrative. At the same time, I think the evidence base has also been critical to open new frontiers of thought leadership. 
um, as we embark to address the, the new challenges or, or more pressing challenges around poly crises uh, marked by a very acute climate crisis, but also by changing dynamics around the social contract, um, it is important that we are ahead of the game and we're focusing on how to best adjust, complement and enhance the systems to really help them to realize their full potential, but also be very mindful or some of the limitations and, and, and that, um, of some of these programs um, and to know that, you know, how much we can ask uh, for a social protection program to do. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot of evidence showing the impact, um, but but also that we we cannot see them as Christmas trees that are going to address all the different programs that, that we have. And I think, you know, being able to continue to address and continue to ask the tough questions, continue to make sure that we are adjusting and making sure programs are responding better um, to the new poor, to the changing dynamics of poverty, to the new drivers of poverty. I think it's it's a critical part of the agenda. And I think the book is is looking and addressing some of those uh, game changers across, across the board. And this region has been at the forefront of, of really putting on the table and raising the visibility and the urgent call that we need to commit to expand coverage, but also to have a really um, conscious commitment to invest in risk-informed systems and in preparedness and the, and the important linkages that need to be done explicitly with disaster risk, um, with, with, with shock responsiveness, with climate um, action and others. And also, and I think this was, was mentioned by the colleague from DFAT, also the importance that it's not just about blanket coverage, but also adequacy in terms of inclusion, gender transformation, disability, migration, and other, which again, makes a huge difference in, in how these programs can actually have the best uh, impact across, across the board. And again, this is something that we've been seeing very, very specifically in, in, in this region, uh, making sure that we are effectively covering and, and reaching the most excluded, but also designing programs that are better able to address the very specific vulnerabilities that some of these groups uh, uh, face. Um, and I really look forward to continue to be able to work with that with that um, lens on enhancing impact, but also opening new um, frontiers in terms of what else we can and cannot do with this with this programs. Um, maybe a, a last set of points around. Yes, it's important to have evidence. It's important to continue to challenge what we have but also to be very conscious that having evidence is not automatically always translate into effective policy change. We need to be very conscious of how we develop the evidence, how we're collecting data, how are we implementing the research. Um, and I think um, throughout the board, and, and also something that I appreciate of the publication, that we have very key lessons of what are some of the elements that we've learned across the board that help to enhance the uptake or the impact around evidence generation. In other words, it's important to have solid, rigorous evidence, but also making sure that we're looking not just an imp at, at impact and cost effectiveness, but also around the design and implementation considerations for that impact. Um, that there are specific contexts and specific dynamics that are going to make a difference around impact. And therefore, you know, the no, no cookie cutter approach have ever worked even within a same region or even within a, a same territory or, or country. Um, the, the very critical important of the political economy um, and to what extent we can definitely understand the different drivers in terms of, of politics that are driving some decisions um, and therefore the ownership of that evidence. If we're developing a research agenda to make sure that it's not an arm's length type uh, process, but it's something that is really engaging all the, the policymakers are really addressing the concerns and helping to better inform changes, enhancing its le legitimacy, its ownership, but also its impact across different elements uh, and different changes that we want to make in terms of program and policy. Um, and linked to this, the timing of the evidence, what are the best pieces of evidence that can be have better impact in different process in time? Um, when there's a specific decision that is being made, when there's you know, um, elements that need to really be at the forefront and where we have champions that are asking for critical changes and taking advantage of that commitment to also feed um, some of those policymakers with the best um, evidence that can be used in that regard. And, and I think that is sometimes what makes a difference in how evidence is, is uptaken uptake, uptake, um, vis-a-vis, you know, having just, you know, uh, discussions around, around uh, uh, other elements. The power of, of, of human interest stories versus having a very sophisticated formula and to what extent also um, showing showcases, 
changes and impact in real time and showing that these programs are not just around numbers and around you know changes and percentages, but it's around changing people's lives and being able to use effectively the evidence and communicate it also effectively across the board uh, to different audiences, to the technical um, audiences, to the researchers, the academics, the policymakers, but also to the general public and helping to really create that um, overarching, if you want, ownership across the board. Um, that these programs are important for the extreme poor, for the poor, but at the end of the day, for everybody to be able to really have a, a very important uh, pillar around resilience and, and, and development. Um, and I think this is a, a process that it's that is you know in, described in many in many of the country example um, really effectively engaging uh, multiple safe, um, stakeholders and, and parts of, of of society to make sure that we have uh, the impacts that that we want to have. Um, I'm, I'm really excited for this uh, milestone and really looking forward to continue to learning together to ensure that social protection is available for every child and that we have the impact that we want to see um, in the, in the in the near future. Um, thanks so much, Andrea. Over to you. Thanks so much, Natalia. Really, thank you for um, for this contribution. I think that the message of telling the right story to the right people in the right way, I think, is a critical one. And also telling the story on success, and also sometimes telling the story of what things went well and didn't went well, is is a critical one. Uh, this is a, a say this is not a unicef publication in the sense it's not a unicef book it's an edited book and is giving the possibility and opportunity to all the stakeholders as you mentioned to tell their stories what 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 they've done is uh, this is why we are very proud of of putting together all the stories of all more than 60 people 70 people actually involved uh, in writing all the articles and how they used the evidence um and that i think is what is in I also important to see the continued engagement of UNICEF in that, in playing the role that uh, we have for many years, and now we are looking at what are the new frontiers, as you mentioned, and also the new way to to use and develop uh, uh, evidence for for everybody. Thanks again, uh, Natalia. I will now give the floor back to Ruben, and to open up the question and answer, starting from the question that I understand we already had in the Q and A. Ruben, over to you. Yes, yeah, thanks, Andrea. I think uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, our panelists have been already replying to some of them, uh, so we will pick a couple of them and try to 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 get uh, the ans the answer as best as we can in the time we have left. Perhaps just to to start by a cross sectoral um, question to all the panelists. Um, this is related to one of the questions about uh, nutrition sensitive social protection. What uh, Richard was asking, what was the evidence that we got in, in Asia Pacific uh, that um, actually it's uh, around improving the nutritional status and nutrition related outcomes uh, among children and women through social protection. So uh, I had in mind, uh, it's a cross sectoral, so open to you all, but perhaps, uh, you know, Felicity from your uh, original perspective, if you have been, uh, you know, commissioning a few uh, guidance and, and research on that. Uh, perhaps you can start by replying. And secondly, perhaps to Dr. Uh, to to Director Rodora uh, around uh, as well. What what is a Philippine experience? As you were mentioning, the cash voucher, uh, the voucher program, and the food poor. And finally, of course, uh, Rosan Chai, perhaps in the around the Chasu program. If you have uh, done some research or work on on nutrition outcomes, uh, over to you. I'll just um, step in really quickly. Um, thanks for the question um, around um, the issue of nutrition and um, the sort of evidence that we're trying to gather around um, what interventions work in that area. Um, DFAT has funded uh, um, an RCT activity in Indonesia that's been going on for a few years um, now. Um, we don't have the results back from that yet, but um, we are seeing that... Um, you know, the, the sort of behaviour change elements that can sit alongside social protection and cash payments can really make a difference here. Um, hopefully, I think um, this um, research project is um, going to be finalised um, sometime early next year and we'll be able to um, share the results then. But um, 
yeah, just I think it's just to watch this space and that we really do need as um sort of a regional community to start collecting more evidence on, on what's working in that area because I think it is still quite a big evidence gap for us, um, to be honest. Thanks, Felicity. Uh, perhaps uh, Professor Shonchai, uh, Dr. Rodora, any, any thought from your side? Uh, yes, uh, just shortly, just uh, to share the result from uh, uh, one of um, uh, my research between the UDCF and the child support plan. Um, we try to um, um, measure is there any um, positive impact of the child support plan. And we um, went through a very uh, rigorous um, um, uh, research design. Um, so we have uh, some um, a, a certain level of confidence of, of the result we have. And the results show very really clearly that even if the child support grant, the amount is not that, uh, it's not that big, it's just um, uh, 600 bucks, about 20% of the poverty line. But the results show very, really, very really clearly that um, the children actually has a better nutrition um, coming from, from, from receiving uh, uh, this money. And the result is even more pronounced um, for the poorest uh, household. So this is, uh, I think this is a direct evidence on the social protection, uh, which is, has a positive impact on, on nutrition. We also found that um, make, um, I might call the indirect evidence. The child support uh, was found to increase the breastfeeding. Um, we don't fully understand the mechanism, but we suspect that because um, the mother received the money, so they do not have to enter into the employment as quickly as before, because now they have money, um, some money, so they can stay with, uh, uh, with the children longer, and that uh, make the children um, can, can, can breastfeed, um, um, so uh, make the mother can, can, can breastfeed the children more than um, a comparable household. So I think this is the indirect evidence on uh, improving in, on the uh, nutrition of the children. Thank you. Dr. Rodora, any thoughts from the Philippines experience? Yeah, um, well, uh, our experience in uh, for peace or the conditional cash transfer, uh, this is really about uh, evidence on improving nutrition sta uh, nutritional status and nutrition-related outcomes, but more on how evidence has actually informed the design of the program of the conditional cash transfer. You know, when we first started it, we were just covering... Um, uh, limited uh, the age of the I, I remember that the the children the age of the children that were covering were not up to um, high school but because of the um, uh, studies uh, that were conducted we extended the grants to up uh, up to uh, um, 18 years old so before it was not we're not covering any children up to 18 but because of certain evidence um we were able to expand the program. Second, uh, of course, um, uh, the the impact evaluation of Pantaweed is continuing, and it actually um, uh, provide information on how are the programs, what are the, the what are the tweaks in the systems and in, 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 in the design that needs to be improved, especially in the delivery of our um, family development session. Uh, the the knowledge that our the, uh, the awareness and the knowledge and of course utilization of all the concepts we have been introducing to them on child and children's protection child rights so those are the I think uh, though not really related to nutritional status and nutrition sensitive um, nutrition related outcomes uh, I just wanted to emphasize that. Um, I think uh, we are actually using really our programs are really um, influenced, heavily influenced by these studies. Thank you, uh, Niasha. Would you like to give a, a global perspective very quickly? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ruben. So 
Yeah, the question of the impact of social protection on nutritional status is, is really important and something that many studies from all over the world have, uh, have been investigating. I'll just briefly talk about uh, recent systematic reviews that have been looking at the global evidence of the impacts of cash transfers on and children's nutrition outcomes. So there is a recent review by Manley and colleagues that was published last year in 2022, which compared Latin America, South Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and East Asia. So there were only 11 studies from the East Asian Pacific region, but it, the analysis showed that cash transfers had the largest effects on um, outcomes like height for age, stunting, and wasting in, in the South Asia region, while in the East Asia and, and, and the Pacific region, the collective evidence only showed positive impacts on the consumption of animal source foods. So one of the main conclusions from that study was that the evidence, there are there evidence gaps um, from, from, from various regions and especially in the East Asian Pacific uh, region. And also, I think is alluded to by one of the speakers that um, improving nutritional status outcomes, especially anthropometric outcomes like wasting or stunting is not usually automatically associated with um, modest uh, income increases. So I, I can stop there. I can put uh, the link of that study into in, into the chat for, for everyone to, to look at. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Uh, I just we have a few minutes left. I, I would just like to refer the last question to Mr. Shrang um, uh, from Cambodia. I think it uh, it fits very well the context. It, it's about uh, uh, Aung was wondering how data systems are being strengthened, uh, especially around uh, ID uh, unique identifications and MIS. So perhaps Cambodia is a, a good uh, example from and the family package and all the work you have done for COVID. Uh, over to you. Thank you. And uh, thank you um, for the question. Uh, let, let me share the experience from Cambodia on this uh, unique ID or identification system. So in Cambodia, we have this independent uh, implemented by a different government institution, the ID poor identification system, which is the identification of poor and vulnerable households. And the system has been expanding to cover other uh, groups as well. Uh, so with this uh, database of uh, poor and vulnerable households, so this is at household level, uh, the institution uh, the National Social Assistance Fund, who is the operator of social assistance program, uh, through API, uh, generate data using the data from this ID pool system to provide a cash transfer to those uh, vulnerable group, poor and vulnerable group. So, right, uh, the, the, the question on unique ID or the the vision of having this uh, social registry in the future are also in our, uh, in the government thinking. Uh, right now, we are also working to expand or to develop a system through API uh, to connect all uh, system, uh, the MIS system of, so of all social assistance program, the uh, uh, targeting uh, database system, the my ID system, the ID for national Cambodian national ID, and now with other systems so that the data and information are uh, interchange, uh, exchange, uh, so that we could have this uh, uh, interconnected system, and would, which leads to also later on a uh, could be a social protection ID, just like uh, other country with social security ID. So uh, this is. Uh, the development uh, of this identification system and unique ID in, in Cambodia. So I would stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think with this, uh, we can wrap up. Back to you, Andrea, for a very few and quick words, uh, final words. Thank you so much, Ruben, and thanks really to everybody. I mean, I don't want to add anything. I think it was very rich and uh, and exciting, I would say, presentation from everybody, from the participants. I want to thank all the authors and all the people that were involved in the articles. It has been a long journey. And I have to you know, acknowledge that this, as I said at the beginning, this is a book of articles written by practitioners, by the people that are doing the job, for the people that are doing this job. Um, and uh, it was long things, I think, 
but it's worthy. I think it's the critical importance of telling the story of what you are doing as a policymaker, as a practitioner, as people doing social protection intervention, together with the academics, together with the technical one that can help you. But I think that was probably the best part of, uh, of, this, uh, of this book or this adventure. And uh, thanks again to everybody. Thanks again uh, to Natalia for being with us. Uh, thanks to Felicity. Thanks to all the colleagues, uh, to Niasha, to, to everybody, to all of you. Uh, and thanks to socialprotection.org. Always a fantastic support on the background to making things happening. has been uh, always a great partnership. And uh, again, I hope to see you again uh, in this kind of webinars. And I really hope to read more and more of your uh, uh, stories and your stories in the future. Thanks again. Uh, to everybody and hope to see you soon. Bye.